Welcome to everyone. We're just letting folks in one by one. So get comfortable. We're glad you're here. I'm gonna go watch. Welcome to all the timely folks who joined us. <laughs> Kudos to you for being on time. It'll be a few more minutes until um, just to wait for a few other folks to uh, sign on, but thank you for being here. Welcome to the Coffee with a Black Guy community conversation. And um, as I say, settle in. If you have a mug, feel free to fill it with a delicious beverage and we'll get started shortly. Helps to be able to see. All right. Welcome, welcome. Oh, wow. Good to see a lot of familiar faces uh, and names on here. Great, great. Judith, Jackie, Mary, Mary Ellen, Miley, yes, yes. Hi, James. Hello, how are you? Hey, good. I appreciate your emails, Patty. You always keep me in the loop. Yeah, <laughs> great. <laughs> You're still looking at Facebook and emails once in a while, huh? Not my daughter. <laughs> trying to, trying to indeed. Yeah. Let's give it a few more minutes. We'll be kicked off here. <laughs> Had to pull a heater into the studio this evening. A little chilly. <laughs> Mm. Howdy. Hello, hello, Howdy. Tony Scott. Nice. Welcome. Thank you. Hey. Good to be here. Mm -hmm. How are you guys doing? Very well. Glad to see some rain, but we'll be glad when it's gone. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Hi guys. Hey Gwen. <clears throat> oh, hey Gwen. Hey James. Hey Gwen. Hey everybody. Hey Charlotte. Charlotte, I owe you an email and I promise I will get back to you like tomorrow. It's been on my mind. You have a cold? You sound kind of. <laughs> Hi, Mary. Hi. Hey, Mary. How are no, you? No, I just ate fast. Okay. <laughs> Zooming now until eight. I'll call then.
Ames, did you see that Tony Scott is in the? I, I did. I did indeed. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Casey, let's, let's, I think we should go, can go ahead and get started. Let's yeah, get why don't we? Well, we have a full Zoom room tonight, and it's wonderful to have all of you join us. I'm Casey Rogers, and I'm a supporter of Coffee with a Black Guy, as well as a resident of Montecito. And um, just really happy to welcome you. We have um, about an hour together, maybe a little bit more. If Unpacking and debriefing what we heard from Isabel Wilkerson at the UCSB Arts and Lecture event on Tuesday. She certainly gave us a lot to think about. She's a prolific writer and historian and um, just incredible thinker for our nation. Um, she started off her remarks on Tuesday by saying that Black history is American history. And so, you know, as we're sort of on the eve of Black History Month, um, you know, let it not be confined to February. Um, and very happy to have you here to engage in dialogue tonight. And uh, there certainly are a lot of activities happening in Santa Barbara for Black History Month and um, something to keep an eye on at uh, Coffee with a Black Guy social media. Before I turn it over to James, I um, really want to say a big thank you and shout out to the sponsors who have made uh, tonight possible. And uh, give me just a second to share my screen with you. Um, I'm getting there. But just to acknowledge uh, really fundamental support from the Santa Barbara Foundation, and in just a minute we'll hear from the CEO, Jackie Carrera, as well as from the Alumni Associ Association at Pacific Graduate Institute, from a hospice of Santa Barbara, as well as the um, Elite Scholars Program, which is uh, run out of the Center for Education and Academic Development, as well as ongoing support from uh, the Montecito Journal. So a big shout out to these folks who've invested in Coffee with a Black Guy and very much want to see these community conversations happen. If anybody on the call is interested in sponsoring future events, um, please reach out at cwabg.com. That's coffee with a black guy.com. And that's definitely a conversation that James would be keen to have. Just a few housekeeping items. It looks like a lot of people have their videos on, which is wonderful because it's so nice to see one another. Um, feel free to put your name in your Zoom square if you haven't already. Uh, we will be doing a little bit of polling tonight just to gauge some input from the crowd. And um, let me just shoot out this first one um, and feel free just to respond to that. And um, there'll be a few others that pop up throughout the night. Let me now turn it over to Jackie Carrera, who's going to give us a few opening remarks, uh, executive director of the Santa Barbara Foundation, as well as introduce uh, our moderator, James. Jackie, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Casey and James, uh, for holding this event and for having me here tonight. Uh, the Santa Barbara Foundation is an enthusiastic sponsor of these conversations, as I think you know. Uh, we have seen, uh, we see community conversations such as these as, as a real critical part of our mission, which is to build empathetic, inclusive, and resilient communities. And uh, we thank James for being a repeat panelist during our monthly coffee and conversation series which we've created to help foster a learning environment um, and an exchange of ideas that deepens our collective understanding of issues that are facing Santa Barbara County, uh, as well as a better understanding of each other. Um, and while we work on 
a lot of really important issues at the foundation. None is more important than our work to advance racial equity. Uh, and tonight, uh, we're here to reflect on the most recent event that was hosted uh, by the UCSB uh, Arts and Lectures program through the Race to Justice series. And during it, Isabel Wilkerson stressed the importance of these kinds of conversations, which she said were key to education. She described speaking with people who, upon learning about our nation's history and about modern experiences of Black people, said to her, I had no idea. And she points out that not having any idea has consequences. And in her eloquent way, if you had the opportunity to hear her or read her material, her books, she draws the analogy to coming into ownership of an old home and not paying attention to a leaky roof or a basement and the consequences it can have if you don't pay attention. Uh, the owner of an old house, she says, and I quote, uh, knows that whatever you're ignoring will never go away and whatever's lurking will fester whether you choose to look or not. Ignorance is no protection from the consequences of inaction. So throughout the Race to Justice series, uh, we heard from incredible speakers the same message, that not having any idea leads us to turn a blind eye, uh, to racism, as Brittany Barnett, who's one of the speakers, described, that leads to the disparate sentencing of African Americans for low-level drug offenses, or to police brutality that leads African Americans to feel and to be unsafe as Ta-Nehisi Coates talked about in his session. And it leads us to ignore our nation's history and to fail to ask questions about who still benefits from slavery and who is still held back because of it as Nicole Hannah Jones spoke about in her presentation. And we've seen the consequences of not having any idea as Isabel Wilkerson warned in the recent murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and far too many others, or when we look at the economic and educational disparities. If we are to make progress towards a truly anti-racist society as the first speaker in the series, Dr. Ibram Kendi implores us to be, we need everyone to have an idea about these issues. And we need to have tough conversations and to act on them. And that's why Santa Barbara Foundation has been so pleased to be a lead sponsor of the Race to Justice series, which um, by bringing high quality authors and leaders to speak to us about these tough, tough issues is providing some of that education that Wilkerson calls for. And why we're so pleased to be sponsors of tonight's event, which allows us to continue these conversations in our own community with the guidance of skilled speaker, facilitator, and host, James Joyce III. James is the founder of Coffee with a Black Guy. And for much of the past decade, he's also served as the district director for Senator, State Senator Hannah Beth Jackson, who's represented nearly a million constituents within Santa Barbara and Ventura counties until terming out in December of 2020. James has served on various advisory boards in the area, including the Impact Hub for Santa Barbara, Ventura County Leadership Academy, uh, Santa Barbara Young Black Professionals, He's on the board of Common Table Foundation, the California Association of Marriage and Family Therapist Education Foundation, as well as the National Board for Student African American Brotherhood, where he has, he also helped found the collegiate chapter while he was an, a student athlete at Ohio University. James has been awarded the Distinguished Citizen Award from the Ventura County NAACP, where he also served as a guest speaker and has been featured in Forbes for his work with Coffee with the Black Guy. Prior to his working in the public service sector, and this is, I think, my favorite part of James, is that he's a Maryland native, like me, and served as a newspaper journalist in several diverse communities around the country, covering a variety of subjects from education to crime, local politics, features, and more. And it is my great pleasure to introduce James Joyce III. Thank you, Thank you so much, Jackie. I, I really appreciate that. And, and that really gives folks a snapshot of who I am. And I'm glad we got that over with because now we're getting into the conversation. And so thank you so much, Jackie, for your continued support. Uh, welcome to the community still. Uh, uh, I can't wait till, till I actually get a chance to hug you in person uh, and do that. And so thank you for, for uh, your support and all that of the sponsor that knows joining us this evening. So now the conversation, how do we have this conversation? Right. Um, some basic ground rules that I like to make sure that we go over as we're getting into the conversation are some just, you know, basic 
respect, right? Be respectful, uh, be genuine, uh, be willing to listen, be willing to feel something, uh, and don't seek to dominate with your story. Uh, and short of that, it makes most, uh, mostly just a, a conversation that we're going to have and, and talk about the thing that uh, Elizabeth Wilkerson brought up on Tuesday night uh, and more, right? You, you heard uh, Jackie talk about some of the, the, the various events that have been happening uh, as part of the Race to Justice series. And, and she did a great job highlighting, you know, we had Nicole Hatton Jones, Ta-Nehisi Coates, uh, Ibram Kendi, um, and more, right? And, and the most recent, uh, Isabel Wilkerson, the author of Cast, and she, um, I, I, I mean, I guess the only way to, to, to sum, sum her up is eloquent. Uh, she's eloquent in her writing, eloquent in her, in her delivery of ideas, uh, and, and that's helpful in moving the conversation forward. Um, and so, you know, I, I just want to provide an opportunity here for folks to, to kind of build community and ask questions, uh, um, you know, uh, share perspectives uh, on things that you've heard uh, on Tuesday or read uh, about uh, Isabel Wilkerson and or uh, the book that she has put forth. Um, and so, right, I, I think we, we're going to do one more uh, survey here right before uh, we get kicked off and start accepting some questions in case somebody's out there being shy. Give you a little bit of time to, to work up the courage to either raise your hand uh, in the uh, uh, virtual chat via Zoom uh, or uh, drop a comment in uh, the chat and we will uh, be monitoring that uh, the best as we can. Um, also, be aware that we are streaming live on Facebook tonight. We actually got that figured out uh, last time we didn't, but we have that on there now. So if you're watching on Facebook and you want to join the conversation, you are not monitoring the conversation there, feel free to go to CWABG, hit the RSVP thing for this event, and you will get the Zoom login information and come join us in the Zoom, and we can uh, engage on that front. So uh, inviting you all over to do that. Uh, Casey, did we... Uh, uh, how are we on the, the survey? We're great. What we learned is that um, about 40% of folks on the call tonight did hear Isabel Wilkerson on Tuesday. And in terms of what people have come to gain, about 50% have come to engage with their community on issues impacting Black people and people of color, um, as well as just learning broadly about issues of race and equity. Great. Great, great, wonderful. Uh, and I would be remiss if I didn't at least point out the fact that we mentioned uh, State Senator Hannah Beth Jackson retired, uh, but we have her in the room here this evening as I got an email from her that she misses me. Uh, so uh, I, I miss her as well and great, uh, great to see her uh, joining us uh, this evening. Well, I, I'm delighted to be here. I just cooked dinner, so this is a relief uh, for me, uh, not being much of a chef. Uh, but I certainly appreciate everything you've done, and uh, I'm so delighted that you are uh, engaged in this endeavor and that all the people here are listening. I remember when we did our first one, when you did your first one, James, there were about five of us in the room, and uh, I, was, I was thrilled beyond words uh, at the discussion, and I'm so glad it's been advancing and, and developing as it has. So we're delighted to be here, and George will be doing the dishes shortly. <laughs> <laughs> great. Great to see you both. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, so I don't know what questions were there from uh, what happened on Tuesday night. The polling showed that about 40% of you all were, were there. Um, and, you know, um, I think one of the, the beginning things that she had mentioned is that uh, the, the language that we use to describe racism, there's this, this, basically her book Cast and the idea of the caste system is that underlying tone to that language, right? And that is, that, that is the reality of, of what we have is beyond that, that, that racism. Uh, she, she pointed out that the racism is, a, or race is a metric to calibrate the caste system. Um, and so that was earth shattering to me. Um, Melissa wants to know, uh, would be interested to know who, if anyone has read Isabel's books, that book and or uh, the, the warmth of our sons. Um, what, I, what, what I did hear her point out about her two books um, and I, the, the case that, that 
you know, we keep coming back to is the conversation of reparations, right? And, and what that means, what that looks like. And essentially she laid out that her two books are exhibit A and exhibit B to make the case for reparations. Um, and all of that threaded under the fact that if, if we knew the real history uh, of our nation and if we were taught the real history of our nation from an early age, that that would change the way that we act. Uh, that would change the way that we look at, at things. And um, that would be the step towards the desire to have repar to, to, to pay reparations. And we can get into that as the questions flow uh, because there was quite a, quite a bit to uh, chew on about that. Any other, uh, any main thoughts or questions from, from Tuesday night? Uh, that, that folks have that would like to engage. I, I had a, uh, can I, yes? Sure, sure, yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. I, it was interesting to me that she pointed out about the father of American democracy is really Martin Luther King Jr. And the mm -hmm. fact that he took that trip to uh, India and only then realized he was part of the untouchables, the caste system. And he came back here and I, I, that was, I, I am into the awareness and uh, growing up in a white bubble in Chicago, uh, I am really interested in uh, expanding my knowledge of, of, of what, what we're talking about. We have a program now going uh, uh, called, called Confronting Racism with Word and Life and you're gonna be one of the speakers. So we are, there's several of us here, I see on the screen from that group. So uh, we're, all, we're all into this, so thank you. Yeah, and Word and Life are reading, you all are reading How to Be an Anti-Racist and they're breaking yeah. that down by chapter. Uh, and so there's various things to plug into uh, throughout the community as we are embarking on this work. And thank you, Judith, for bringing that up because that was a, a, a moment for me as well in, in uh, uh, Isabel's you know, explanation of Dr. King's 1959 trip to India. And the fact that it wasn't until he was introduced by a teacher in a, in a classroom in Southern India, he was introduced to the class as this is an untouchable. And that, 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 that resonated with what they perceived in their caste system. And um, my understanding of what that means is that beyond, you know, although he was, you know, pretty much born to a working class family, you know, his, his father a pastor, uh, his, his mother a laborer, um, the, the things that, that, that he was able to achieve, the awareness that he was able to bring around him, uh, put him in a class of untouchable until he was shot at it. Um, but uh, there, there's this element that he was able to transcend from his, I guess, designated class to a, a, another level of influence to, to other classes. Thank you. Isn't it a great irony that Martin Luther King was assassinated as was Mahatma Gandhi? Um, uh, these are people who preach peace uh, and nonviolence and love. And I think of that because it, when I was in India a year or two ago, um, we went to his, uh, the place where he, he was actually assassinated. Uh, there's, they've made it into a memorial of sorts. Um, I, I wonder, uh, James, if you have any thoughts, um, you know, some of the great people uh, who have preached that nonviolence um, not just in India, but, but in the United States, uh, Martin Luther King, JFK, uh, others who, who really tried to bring um, the, uh, the races together, uh, suffering that kind of demise. Um, how does that, how do you feel about that? What, what does that mean to you? What is its significance? Well, I, that, that, that's a great question. And thank you, because I think that is a that question is at the root of where we are today, right? When you see the, the, the model of Black Lives Matter and how it's got a, a, a diffused leadership model, there's like, I've never spoken to a Black Lives, like Black Lives Matter leader. I've spoken to organizers, but there, there's no one who, who's like the chair of, right? And so that came from the concept of 
once you become a leader, you're put out there, that target is on your back, and then that happens, right? And that has happened time and time again. And so um, I think that that is an explanation as to why we are, you know, where we are today with our, our various leadership models. Um, where do, what does that mean for me personally? I never, like that whole notion of nonviolence never personally resonated with me. I couldn't understand that notion of getting hit in one cheek and turning the other one to get hit again. It just doesn't make sense to me. Um, but I learned to respect it. Um, that's not that's not the pill I swallow, right? I'm 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 nonviolent um, and, until I'm attacked, right? And 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 then you know violence is met with violence. But that notion that you're going to be nonviolent regardless is the, that's the, I think that's the danger. Uh, and, and that has been kind of the downfall of those various leaderships uh, models. Um, and so what I've heard some, some who, who have been out in, in, in the trenches, doing the work in the communities uh, say that they're, uh, they're not nonviolent, they're non-aggressive. Um, so they're not gonna be the aggressor, but I'm not nonviolent. Um, and so, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a different, way of going about things because you see you know what where we've gone with the the movement so far this summer and you know in recent years uh, people are get kind of distracted from the message of the reason for protest because of well the riots why are they burning and tearing up their neighborhood um, and you know I think Dr. King addressed that as well in, in, in mentioning that you know uh, the riot is, is the, the language of the unheard um, um, or protest is the language of the, of the unheard and the riot is the, the, the language of the um, uneducated. Um, but yeah, I mean, those, those are some thoughts on, on, on that concept, uh, but you know, there's a variety of ideas out there on that. And, and, and there's, there are still, I mean, I, I've met uh, um, uh, Reverend James Lawrence, uh, who, who the father of the anti, you know, the, the US, uh, um, you know, Nonviolent movement. Uh, he's a pastor down in, in the LA area, and you know, I, I get it. I respect him. I respect that approach. Um, but like like all things, uh, it, there has to be an evolution, right? And and I think that we've evolved a little bit beyond just the, the strictly nonviolence. Uh, I, I did get I have a question from from Mike here in, in the chat. Wanted to know uh, that in the United States, how many how many casts are there? Uh, white, black, white, and other many tiers. So that's a difficult question because there's many metrics that designate this cast. As I'm as I'm learning from Isabel Wilkerson, right? Um, that there's you know you can have place of origin, right? And so if you're from if you're from the South, you're gonna likely talk a certain way. So language is another metric. So we make value judgments based on the language people use. Uh, you know, in, in my journalistic teachings, they were, uh, uh, they said that the most pure form of the American, of, of American English is uh, geographically right outside of the Columbus, Ohio area. Now, I did go to school in Southeast Ohio, so it, they may have been a little biased, but th when you're talking about the, the language that, uh, they, that, that TV broadcasters are uh, encouraged to utilize and the AP style, that kind of stuff, it, it, it's, it's, geographically centered around that. And so if you hear somebody with a Southern draw, you may be inclined to make a certain value judgment about that individual. They may, you may feel that they're less intelligent. Um, you know, you may offer, ask them about moonshine. Like these are implicit biases that we bring to, to those kind of conversations. Um, and so, you know, as, as far as like how many different castes, castes there are in, in, in the United States, um, I, I would like to say probably, you know, infinite, right? Because even within communities, even within small groups, there's hierarchy. Um, and, you know, I'm just thinking back to the guys I grew up with, like there was a hierarchy within there. And pretty much every Friday, we tested that hierarchy because while we were hanging out at the park, we would box one another um, and just call, we call it going to the body. And so like that hierarchy was tested based on that. And, and that's just a small a petri dish of what else happens throughout, let's think in a business setting, think in a city, county, state, you know, it continues to grow. So um, that that's my, my perspective on that, Mike, and thank you for that question. Um, 
let's see, Rachel, let me see, for whatever it might be irrelevant, or relevant, excuse me, I would love to hear your thoughts on what reparations might look like here in Santa Barbara, looking uh, at real practical rather than theory. I'm in the fundraising grant making space here in town. Great. Um, so what would reparations look like? That is uh, actually going to be the topic of a, of a committee that the uh, legislature ha is putting together. Um, and I don't recall the bill number on that, but I do know that the, the, the uh, com I think it's a nine person committee is being pulled together to study uh, what that, to answer that question, what would reparations look like in California? Um, and so when you break down to what does that look like in Santa Barbara, it, it may simply be social equity programs. It may be really having conversations about reimagining what policing looks like. Uh, I, I saw something about the city of Austin. Uh, they just bought a hotel uh, to house homeless with the money that they quote unquote defunded their police with. So instead of spending money for their police to deal with the homeless folks, they took that money, redirected it, bought a property and said, here, go live here. Brilliant idea. They did it in Ventura too, uh, at the, what is it, the Vagabond End, I believe it is. And so, you know, that's, that's just some examples of like practically what that could look like. It could also come in the form of, uh, 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 you know, education waivers, or uh, I've heard conversations of um, having the option of uh, free tuition, uh, uh, universal health care, or uh, um, there was some other element that, that was, oh, a, a boosted credit score, so an 850 credit score. So you get to choose what, which, which uh, uh, cue you wanted to, to look at uh, or follow for your, rep, your, your specific reparation. And so, I mean, those are some ideas that are out there. I think that the fact that the state of California is actually having the conversation um, it is the first step, right? There's been a bill at the federal level, HR 40, that has been sitting dormant, it's introduced every session uh, and doesn't go anywhere. Same thing, Bill asking to do, to, to form a commission to study the idea of reparations, not asking to do anything, just study it, right? And so uh, there has been a prohibition to, 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 uh, to the desire to do that. Um, so, I mean, those are just some examples. Maybe other folks have, have, have other ideas of what that, that might, might look like. Um, so James, the last yes. time you did this, the last program uh, you did this, you pointed to fund for reparations now. Yes. And um, this is a program of the National African American Reparations Commission. They have an amazing 10 point program. I mean, it's really well thought out. And um, so I really appreciate your, your passing along that information, but that, I mean, this the question about what we could do in Santa Barbara, I mean, our creativity can lead us anywhere, but that's a really good basic, you know, framework for it. I'm really, really looking forward to delving more into it and learning more about that group. Yeah, no, likewise, Mary, thank you for that, because uh, I've, I've actually been in communication with them on social media about potentially doing a, a Instagram live or maybe even just a meeting so I can learn more about what they are. But it seems to be and they state themselves to be it's a, a, an ally network. It's white folks who believe in reparations and they believe in this 10 point reparation plan. And so, you know, that, that thank you for bringing that up because that is one way that, that Santa Barbara could get involved, right? Uh, that, you know, there's not gonna be shy. There's a lot of white folks in Santa Barbara. So you, we could all join the organization to find out more about this and, 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 you know, find out about what this 10 point plan is and then educate our neighbors about that, right? That's the work that, 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 that needs to happen. That's community building. And, and, and I think that's how we move this, this issue forward. James, what's the name of that program? Uh, it's the reparations, the reparation fund now. Now. That's right, Mary. Did I get that right? Yeah. And I included the link oh, in the chat. Fund, fund for reparations now. I'll put it yes. in. Great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that information or that link is, is in the chat. Uh, and that's what you're missing if you're on Facebook and not on Zoom. So come on over if you're on Facebook so you can join the conversation. <laughs> um, and we yes. have a comment from Jeff just reiterating that um, 
that the impact of reparations not just be a one-time impact, but you know, really driving at sustainable change. Yeah, no, it, it does. Uh, was that Jeff Moore's comment you were talking about? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, that that is that is good. I have a question for you. Sure. Uh, you know, I think it's first of all, I, I just so appreciate that you're doing this, and I know that it's taken time to really build it up, and I think it's it's amazing. So thank you. Um, and I think it's it is important, you know, that we get to read and hear stories of people like Isabel Wilkinson or Te Hennessy Coates or Iram Kendi or you know all of these amazing people who are willing to sort of go out there and help move things forward. But I always sort of fundamentally feel that an important piece of really digging beneath difference and and the othering people when you talk about anti being an anti-racist is opportunities that are created for people to get to know each other and to spend time together because I, I you know and I, I it always strikes me that Santa Barbara as um, uh, diverse as it is is awfully segregated and I just wonder what opportunities you see for people to get together and know each other on a human level. And I say that as a Jew who's experienced anti-Semitism and, you know, and I, and certainly in terms of, you know, um, you know, black people and Latina people and. Yeah, no, th thank you for that question, Gwen. And, and, um, so this platform, it, I found out after I created it, was is rooted in something called contact theory, uh, and it's a theory of like de-othering, right? The more you're in contact with the other, the, the the less likely you are to see them as the other. So right back to Isabel Wilkerson's point of we all have more in common than what we would like to admit. Uh, how and and the idea that these differences that we see are kind of uh, artificial, um, and so you know a softball answer to that is the Common Table Foundation, right? The work that, that the Common Table Foundation does, I'm on the, on the board of, of that, uh, is, is exactly what you're talking about, Gwen, is, is building that authentic community by putting a, no, this is after we all get vaccinated and COVID is, is, is uh, in our rear view, uh, and we find what our, our, our new connectability is, uh, but based on the model of putting a table in the middle of a street shutting down the street and saying, everybody bring your food, come sit down and talk. Um, and, you know, that's a simple concept. It doesn't require a bunch of grant money, doesn't require, you know, uh, uh, you know, requires some, some, you know, uh, governmental cooperation to shut down the streets, of course, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a, a simple way. And it's just, it's a, it's a simple extension of something that we should be doing anyway. And that's sitting down for dinner, sitting down for meals and having conversations like that commute, having time for having communal connection is, is, is what we need. Um, and, you know, I, I No, I was just going to say, I ahead. think as we're thinking about this going forward, I, I mean, I love common table and I think you're absolutely right. <laughs> but it also strikes me that the times you most get to know people are when you're doing a project with them, when you're working right. with them on something and you're engaged in a common goal together. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and that is such a good opportunity. And I remember years ago, I was in LA um, on and helped start an organization called LA Works. And it was just creating like volunteer projects around the city that kind of grouped people together to work on a mural or work on a, and um, I'm sure there are things like that going on here, but I, I, I just, I do think that in engaging with people on something, and sometimes it's conversation like what you create, but sometimes it's not talking about the elephant in the room, but just getting to know each other by working together on something that really helps bond people. So it's one of the Yeah, no, and that, that, I mean, that's absolutely right. I, I was using the common table as an example of how do you start that connection with that other, right? Yeah. You, you sit there, you have that conversation, and then, then you find out what your common connection is. From that, you're like, oh, well, I'm working on this. Uh, I have an event, blah, blah, blah. That person goes to that. All of a sudden, you've got a community, right? You do that five times, and you got yourself a little community. Um, and so, you know, that, that's really what this is. And, and I, I mean, let's be honest. 
Like once we get out of COVID, like we're all touch deprived. We're all gonna have, I mean, even the introverts in our community are gonna need to be out and among people. Uh, and so the more opportunities that we see to have that connection, uh, to be, you know, once we're able to gather, to, to, to really take advantage of those things and, and, you know, prioritize that as you should, right, in your life. Like, okay, connect with your family, all the things that you need to do. But I, I would venture to say that venturing out and connecting with people is going to be a higher priority to, priority to me now because I value it more because it's been taken from me for the past year, right? And so I, I think that, that there's something you know, that, that, that speaks across society for that, for that as well. Oh, we're going, I'm, I'm a little bit behind here on the questions. Uh, let me see here. Um, James, I think we have a few questions that are kind of similar and um, grappling with the macro and micro concept and you know, the policy at you know, a federal or state level versus just getting busy working at a very local level to see some traction. Yeah, well, I mean, again, like lo local connections, and, and I'm, I'm a firm believer of the concept that all politics is local, right? Everything that you, I mean, you can talk about whatever it is, reparations at the national level, what does that look like at the ground level? I mean, you know, I, I've, I think last session, I spoke a little bit about, you know, the concept of creating an office of Black American research to allow Black Americans who believe that they're descendants of slaves to be able to go and say, hey, here's the research I've done on my family so far. I need your help. Then this organ or this, this government entity would uh, be staffed with researchers to help Black folks track their ancestry back to their origin as far as they can. Right. And then once you once this this entity has done that, you get you know, out the end of the machine, you get this little ticket that says, all right, you are. Uh, you know, connected to X, Y, Z, who was a slave on such and such plantation, connected to da, 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 was traded to this, that, and the other, gives you that whole rundown. And then you can take that and then figure out what reparations looks like, right? Once you've been validated, quote unquote, then you can go and find, find out, you know, what, what do reparations look like? Now, most things that happen at the federal level like that get handed down by local grants, right? And so, you know, a lot of the, the money that, that state and local governments get comes from the federal government for, as a pass-through. So um, utilizing that concept, you know, my thought would be that, per, you know, or Casey and I have talked about reparations is going to be more than just a financial aspect, that there's going to have to be a very heavy educational aspect. Isabel Wilkerson, uh, um, you know, validated that on Tuesday as well. Um, and so, you know, really moving to that parallel track, like, okay, yeah, there's, there's, there's funding, but then there's also the education, right? And so, you know, programs like this and others would be funded through that, would be eligible for funding through that because it's helping have these conversations and start that education. Universities would be able to have access to that funding once they start programs that really teach the true history of America. Right, and that's what the whole thing is. It's 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 not like we don't know what happened. It, it's it's this cognitive dissonance that we have with the reality. I mean, America is what it is, uh, and and we we tend to to have this uh, um, you know reimagined view of of who we are, and you know, just as we're seeing a more complete picture of our leaders, such as you know the declassification of of, of uh, classified documents on Dr. King, we're finding out the more the totality of his character. Yes, he was a great man, but then he also had some things that not everybody's going to be happy about when they learn about, right? Well, that's America. Yes, we're a great country, but we got this really black and ugly dark side that created this great side, right? And until we address that reality of how we started this, instead of just acting like, oh, yeah, yeah, forget about that. That was too, too long ago. We need to keep focusing on how we're moving forward. Yes, that's true. But you need to also understand the reality of how we how we started and, and how we how we've developed and the mistakes that we've made and don't just ignore our mistakes, learn and grow from our mistakes. I mean, that's very that's a very American concept that we seem to forget when it comes to figuring out this racial thing. James, can I just um, tell you, there was a conversation that Isabel Wilkerson was in on the other night. There was a, a separate one. And um, someone raised the idea of a federal agency and she jumped right on it, but it was for an office of culture, history and culture. Mm 
-hmm. And it was, you know, she mentioned several times um, in her talk that it's so this education piece is so important, but what she kept saying is it's, it's everyone needs to be singing from the same song sheet or on the same page. And so having that, that federal agency that would also be working simultaneously to kind of tell her that get the history straight and and have that trickle down to the local levels she was she spoke so eloquently about it by the time she was done I was like she'd be a great secretary of that new agency <laughs> right yeah well I mean that that's that's the kind of you know leadership that we need on this on this this issue right and 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 you know all this post George Floyd awakening and the post insurrection awakening is great but what are we going to do with that, right? Like, yeah, there, uh, like I get it. It's going to take a time, time, some time to digest the reality of this for a lot of people, um, and that's why we talk through these things. But you know, moving that past just those things. And and when I mention, you know, okay, so now that that you have, now that you know better, do better. Um, well, what does that look like locally? I think is a question that that that, that, that was being asked, Casey. And you know, that that means when there are issues that come up locally, whether it's in the schools dealing with curriculum, uh, whether it's the, the, the disproportionate uh, suspensions of black and brown students in our schools, like these are things that are real and are happening here. The, the, the feeling of disenfranchisement by black and brown students up at SBCC, the clear and open harassment of these individuals by members of our community, like these are, that's, these are real lived experiences that are happening in our community now. And these are things that we all can do something about. We just need to make sure that we wake up to them here and not think Santa Barbara is in a bubble because we are, but at the same time, we aren't. Uh, I point out the reality, and yes, I know it's, a, it's kind of an outlier. However, the reality is that our local daily newspaper is the only one, was the, well, excuse me, the first one to uh, endorse Donald Trump in 2016 uh, in both the primary and the general, and they did it again uh, in this last. So uh, that has some sort of support or else that business wouldn't still exist in town. Um, yeah, I understand the owner's rage. So James, Tony Scott has something to share as does Judge George. Please, let's hear from Tony Scott. And if you all don't know about Tony Scott, T-O-N-I Scott, check her out. She's local, her artwork is so dope. Uh, one day I'll be able to afford a piece, uh, but I mean, yeah, and it comes with a very beautiful story. So, uh, if, if to, did you unmute her, Casey? Uh, yes, I think yep, she's good to go. Great, uh, first, I want to say, James, I've got something for everyone's uh, wallet, so don't be turned off by the big numbers that you see out there. I've got all sorts of things, but but really, the I have story expensive I taste. <laughs> Okay, well then, whatever. I got that too. <laughs> um, so I just want to share a couple of stories. Um, I had an exhibit uh, at uh, CCH Pounders uh, Gallery and um, Los Silas, and CCH Pounders is an actress. And I had a very short amount of time to put this together. And it was an installation about slavery, which included my family ancestry and so forth. And I was invited to do the installation, but I had like two weeks. So I sent out emails to people and I said, you know, if, if you can't do it, send it to someone else, someone else, someone else. And so I got an email uh, one day from Barbara Larson. I don't know if you guys know Barbara Larson, but she responded and she says, you know, uh, I'm going to grab my friend Tim and we're going to take the truck and we're going to come there and we're going to help you build this. I had never met Barbara you know, knew nothing about her, for, but for three days, she helped me construct a slave cabin. And then later on, uh, 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 Jan from 10 West came to help, you know, just prepare these slave narratives that were going inside of that. So, and, you know, community coming together, and this is just such a unique uh, thing. There were specific reasons that inspired uh, Barb. Um, she was good friends with uh, Medgar Evers' son. Uh, he passed away, you know, his father was assassinated. And she just felt this calling to, to want to be supportive. Um, and then, you know, I wanted to, so that's a, you know, a good story about coming together as a community in areas that, you know, I know Barb and Dan were not familiar with the depth of the narrative that I shared. You know, I have pictures of ancestors who are, are slaves and, you know, a book this, this thick about our whole history that my uncle 
spent about 10 years putting together. Um, the second part of one is another story I wanted to share is, you know, when I decided to get my MFA at UCSB and Richard Ross, who was very sensitive to, you know, uh, increasing diversity into the program. I don't know if you know him. He has these wonderful books on juvenile justice. Um, and, you know, it really contributed in a big way, at least towards my experience and my colleagues. I think it may have been the first time that half the MFA students were, you know, people of color. Um, and with that, you know, offered, uh, and I'm not saying this is a reparation, but just offered uh, for those that had a, more struggles than others, you know, a scholarship and uh, to, and an option to, you know, first year, here's a big scholarship, you can work, not work, but just to get immersive. But one of the conversations we had and just the reality of things um, is that, you know, do you know about, you know, the, the community of Santa Barbara? How do you feel about coming to a community that's predominantly white? How are you gonna feel not having a community? And, um, you know, thankfully that my class had a mixture, you know, we had uh, Hispanic, Carlos, and you know, uh, Daria, who's from Iran, but I did feel, you know, uh, an isolation, but, you know, but the support made a huge difference. Uh, I don't know what level of recruiting they're doing now, but he was really specific about bringing people in. So, you know, that really made a huge difference uh, in my journey here and the, the outreach, you know, like through the Squire Foundation invitations to be a part of something and it helped immerse myself more in the community. I've had, you know, moments of really specific racist, you know, moments, but, you know, um, something that can handle, it was, you know, it was disheartening, but, you know, the, the, the love certainly outweighed, you know, that, those particular uh, situations. And, on um, you know, the, uh, the story of reparations, you know, it's just something that has been an you know, curiosity to me because because I have so many documents about my family ancestry, property, the purchases of slaves, who bought it, who bought what, what that value is, where these places were, um, and you know, through the the research that my uncle uh, put out to find out our family ancestry, he found the fast the white part of our family history, the Europeans, and they were interested to know whether or not we were related, and we took a DNA test. And I remember one family member who was, you know, interested at one point, but really drew back. And, and honestly, I just wondered, you know, could this be, have been a question of, well, you know, this could be now an issue of reparations. You know, we know that our family owned, you know, 150 slaves, you know, we, we you know, had all of this, you know, benefits from this. Is, is Tony's family gonna ask for this, you know, back? And so, um, I'm still in contact with another member who, you know, he and I talk. Um, he's very proud of my work. My work, I, I don't know if he's, it's very focused on social justice. A huge amount of it is about slavery um, and just this calling of feeling a responsibility as an artist to be able to create something that I thought would be educational, build empathy. And I think we learn a lot when you can see the other person's side and, and really have it you know, visibly um, and in a very uh, just, you know, expressive way to put things in the context of things. So, you know, I just wanted to share those good stories, you know, and in yeah. contrast to so many things that you touched on. No, and, and, and thank you for that, because that actually hits on one of the elements I wanted to uh, touch on that, that Isabel Wilkerson talked about. And I'm sure this resonates with you because I've seen your work, right? Art is the transfer of emotion from one person to another. Right. And and that that describes your your work. Right. That, you know, you've done you found you know, discovered this history about your family and you felt a way about it. And how did you transfer that is through your art, artistic expression and, and, and it shows. Right. And so, you know, she also spoke about and you may have heard me speak about in the past, this whole idea of a continuum. Well, that I mean, Tony, that's right along the continuum. Right. We all utilize our own skill set to plug into this thing, right? And, and so you you found out at an early age that, that you have this skill for art and this this expression. Uh, that's not my skill set, right? So I can't deliver that. Um, and so we, you know, 
the key, kind of taking it back to that question, Casey, is how does that look on the local level? It's finding out and tapping into what, how your skill set can plug into this movement. How does your skill set fill in and catch on the continuum, wherever, wherever you are along that continuum? Um, and, you know, the, the idea that I have is, is one, gen, one time, I, or there was a, a Coffee with a Black Eye session we had in person June 2019, and at, it was at Breakfast Culture Club. And afterwards, there was a, a, a young white guy came up to me and he's like, look, man, I, you know, I'm not much of a speaker. I didn't want to get up and say anything, but, you know, I'm, I make music. So you've inspired me. This conversation has inspired me. I'm going to go home and make some music. So he, he went home, made some music. And who knows, that piece that he made may be what somebody listens to after they're disturbed by the conversation that we're having here. They go to listen to that song that he created after leaving. Like, so that's, that's the continuum that we're living. That's the community building that we're having. And, and I mean, that we're gonna need to move this thing forward. And it's not instant, right? We, we, we live in an instant gratification society and that's to our own detriment for this instance, because we're not gonna see instant feedback on it's going to be slow. It's going to be gradual and incremental. Uh, but we're getting there. We are getting there. Um, I did see that Judge George had a, a statement uh, that he wanted to make about, oh, yeah, about the, the, the fact that um, it's not like we don't know what happened. Uh, it's that we, we just, it's inconvenient. And I think we've heard uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates talk about that. It's like the American no, that was uh, uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones saying that how the, the Black American story is the inconvenient story for, for America. James, uh, am, I, am I heard? Did, yeah, yes, sir. James, you were born in Maryland. Yes. And I was born in Maryland. And I'm reading the biography now that I commend to everyone of another guy who was born in Maryland. His name is Frederick Douglass. And the horror of the lives that were lived then uh, struck me in such a way that I wondered why in the world when I went to a public high school in Cumberland, Maryland, was Frederick Douglass never mentioned a hundred years after his glorious life. And so when you say it's not like we don't know what happened. I really feel that one of our biggest problems is that not enough people know what happened. We uh, hosted the uh, Henrietta Marie exhibit here in Santa Barbara about 20 years ago and exposed students to the horrors of the slave ships. But it seems to me that we need to do a strong educational component of the whole reparation program that teaches, teaches what slavery was, what it really was, and how it's been perpetuated through the Jim Crow laws and, and um, the post-Reconstruction era and how the intimidation of Black people has been perpetuated and what, what it is that cries out for the concept of reparation. I, I think that education and in involving intergenerational groups to come together and confront the reality of our nation's history is imperative. And so I, I, I just think it's dangerous for you to say, well, we, it's not like we don't know what happened because I don't, Everybody on this call may know what happened, but I don't think enough other people know what happened. And when they're confronted with that reality, they can gain a better appreciation for the pain that people have suffered over the generations and, tr and find ways to do something about that. I, I, I see a, 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 a retirement future for you in education. <laughs> <laughs> can can I respond to? Can I respond to sure, uh, the sure, judge? Please, Tony. Um, you are just spot on, sir. You're really spot on. And that was what drove me to want to do this installation called Bloodlines. This installation included a woman on an auction block who had, you know, uh, the metal around her neck to keep her from running away. 
it had a slave ship where you could squeeze in the space and feel the width of what it might have been like on the bottom of the slave ship and see life body casts of people there. The, the voices of slaves spoke in a cabin with their first person narratives from the Library of Congress, which is, has an enormous 2,300 first person narratives and so on and so on and so on. It was a big show. And, I, and some of the responses were, I didn't know this or I didn't know how horrific this was. Um, and I do think that, you know, it does need to be relayed. Reading it in a book is one thing. As an artist, I wanted to bring it into a three-dimensional space. Is it something that, you know, I thought about young kids. I remember going on field trips and how these things stayed with me. You know, in that installation, I, I tried to balance it so that kids that weren't frightened, but they still understood. And I did that through color and, you know, this, that, any other, the, the, the color of the installation. But I think it's really critical to, to try to bring it in a more visceral way. Um, it's, it's just, you know, you, you can't get it from reading. And like you said, in, in most of these textbooks, it's not displayed. But the experience was so, reading it was so horrific for me in the journey, I had to find my heroes. And Frederick Douglass was one of my heroes that I read constantly to, you know, to, to just travel through this and see, you know, the incredible need of doing this regardless of how painful you know their experience was and so he's in the i had an eight foot piece of him with this whole book decoupage behind him bigger than life so and that represented resilience and being able to he pulled himself up from taught himself how to read and became an orator so i just want to say you know i agree with you that, that just reading it is, is not enough and um you know for me it's been taking it and creating these places that people can go and experience a little bit, you know, and increase the insight. And I, you know, I've, of all ethnicities, people have come out and said, I didn't know that. I didn't know it was that bad or, you know, um, are healed from it. I get to, now I see why, you know, trauma, this trauma is a part of my family. I, I don't even know people know genetically that trauma is passed on, you know, and has an impact. So, yeah, I just want to comment on that because that to me it was just so spot on and one of the things that I think is really needed. Yeah, no, th thank you for that. And I guess I, my approach to that is kind of from a no excuses concept. It's like, you know, we have access to all of that information at our fingertips. I go on YouTube to figure out how to change my power steering pump. I'm sure I can go on the YouTube and find out some stuff about, you know, the, I know because I have about, you know, historical documentaries that talk about this reality. Uh, on, the, on Netflix, you can watch a Ava DuVernay's 13 that takes you through that history, right? There's a lot of information that, that is out there at our fingertips uh, to educate us on these things. It's just, there's, it, there's, it's not convenient to do so. And, and I think what Isabel Wilkerson would argue is that to do so would, to di would disrupt the social order, right? James, I'd um, like, can I add on to something about what uh, Judge George was just saying? Sure, uh, sure, go ahead. Cer certainly agree with him after, tw uh, Isabel Wilkerson was saying there's 12 generations of slavery, 246 years of people being put down, put down, lynched. I mean, terrible things that happened. But look what the black people rose up and did for us just now. The black vote right now in the last election saved democracy. So look at what we have to, uh, to uh, bow down for people who went through everything they went through, but they rose up to save democracy just now. I just wanted to make that comment. Yeah, no, no th thank you for that, that context. And it also points to like just the, the concept that we, we don't know, like, okay, so, uh, you know, Thinking of and learning about inventions and, and when things happen. Okay, we're taught, you know, Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. You know, what year did that happen in? Who, who was doing the work in that year? So Thomas Edison did what? Like, it's just a simple questioning, right? Like, so for me, I'm a big fan of the Kentucky Derby. I love going to the Kentucky Derby. Didn't really dawn on me that, of course, all the trainers and the jockeys in the early years of the Kentucky Derby were black because white people weren't doing the work. They weren't walking, hot walking the horses. They weren't doing that stuff. Uh, and, and I can speak about that because I, Tony, I've done a little bit of research on my family and I, I've got that, that back end connection I'd love to talk some more about. But, um, you know, it, it's just a little bit of like a, a little bit of critical thought as we're learning the things that we're fed. Um, and I think that that is what 
the, the root and reality of what education should be. Um, and that's what we should be, be encouraging. All right, I, I know we're, we're coming up here on the hour and some people do uh, have limited time span or limited attention spans. Uh, so there's a few heist housekeeping things I wanna make sure that I touch on before we head out. So you see the merchandise, you see the mugs. Well, guess what? We've got a special code for y'all tonight. From now until Monday, we've got 20% off if you use the code JUSTICE2021. Guess what? I'm gonna go ahead and type that into the chat here in a second. If you want to utilize that and go to the web page um, and just plop that code in and you get 20% off. Uh, and so as we're heading into Black History Month, I know a lot of folks are trying to look look to express their, their support and, and figure out how uh, they can help make a difference in their communities. Well, I strongly argue that if you walk around with anything that says coffee with the Black guy, we also have something to say CWABG in case you don't want to be that that out front. But um, that starts the conversation. That gets the wheels turning in people's mind. They may not even say something to you, but that may cause a conversation once they go home. Like one supporter told me that uh, her kids, she was telling her kids that she was going to a coffee with the black guy conversation and her kids felt that she shouldn't be saying that. And that opened a conversation in their household about the proper usage of how you identify people. Well, guess what? Had she not said coffee with the black guy, that whole conversation wouldn't have happened. So that's kind of what, what this is uh, about, is making sure that we don't, uh, don't miss the opportunity to, to advance ourselves individually or collectively. Um, and Gwen is saying that hot chocolate goes well in the mug as well as coffee tastes better in it. So thank you, appreciate that. <laughs> um, there was a, uh, um, Patty Braga had something that she had asked early on that you wanted me to touch on. Oh, okay, so uh, a little bit about how as non uh, people of color can advocate better for people of color friends and maybe even find some things that, that we shouldn't do. Um, you know, the, there, there are some tips maybe like, you know, don't just talk to your black friends about the black things like, you know, like we've talked about in the Young Black Professionals, uh, a, an employee of, of, an, of a company close uh, locally, her, uh, she, an African-American woman, her coworkers only speak to her when they're talking about hip hop and then they bring her into the conversation. Short of that, they ignore her, right? That's not the kind of thing that you're, that you're gonna wanna do. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's something to, to shy away from. But, you know, I mentioned, you know, the re uh, reparation fund now is, is one avenue, surge, uh, in our community, uh, showing up for racial justice. They, they do a great job uh, getting plugging you into things. And, and I, I wouldn't doubt it if we have a surge member or two on the line here tonight. Um, you know, that, that's a thing. Um, thinking creatively, right? And so as you're navigating your life and you, uh, you know, you're going to this fundraiser when we can go again, but you're going to a fundraiser and you look around the room, like if you're, if you don't see any people of color in the room, like that should make you feel some kind of way. And you should be asking yourself some questions about why you're in that room that's not diversified, right? Be bold enough and go ask the, uh, go have a conversation and set up a meeting with the organizers to ask those questions, right? In a respectful way. But I think we're in the, in the, in the environment now in, in America where, you know, you, being, what they say is, is uh, just being not racist isn't enough. Uh, being actively anti-racist is what we're looking for, and and you know we can't carry the weight all our, all our on our own. Um, you know we talk about and I heard Tony pointing out like and and we of course there's a lot of pain and struggle that goes with slavery, but I know my black people, and I I would be very hell bent to believe that there weren't some funny slaves right that that made good light of the situation that they were in, but through a creative way right uh, looking at uh, there was a, a picture I saw on social media recently that was, uh, I, you know, putting side by side photos of some black celebrities that we know and Afro and Afro Latino individuals. And so showing a slave from Alabama and then showing a picture of Wesley Snipes and seeing the same facial structure, right? So what is it about the fact that Wesley Snipes is allowed to excel in our American ideals and this slave was enslaved? Where did we go between those two points? Right, that's some thought process to have. That's the the kind of development that we're that that I think would be helpful 
uh, as we move these things forward in, in our communities. And so, um, you know, whether that be, you know, at, at, your, at your children's schools or, or getting involved on various levels, uh, uh, find a way to plug in and tap in to, to this issue. And, and, you know, it will take some creativity, um, but one clear and easy way is the UCSB Race to Justice series, right? I mean, this, this Race to Justice series brings the top-notch thinkers on these things to, to our fingertips, right? Um, and so uh, we, we have the opportunity to, to, to hear from these folks and read, read their books. And, um, you know, I, I wholeheartedly agree with what ta Coates had mentioned a, a few weeks ago, is that that concept of, of reading a book is a very intimate experience, right? You're, it's you and that story. But we live in the world with other people, right? And so how do you go from taking that, that intimate act and putting it into your life as you're navigating through the world, right? And so that's why these kinds of conversations uh, are important. Um, and, and, you know, they should be happening outside of this as well. Uh, I, I guess, uh, as, as one supporter has pointed out, that these conversations are kind of like going to church on Sunday. You're supposed to be doing all that work out there throughout the week, but you come here on Sunday to get recharged so you can go do some more work. And so, I mean, that's essentially what, what we're doing. We're, we're having to be out there. We're having to be uh, social justice warriors. We're having to be uh, uh, Trojan horses when we go to work uh, uh, as far as bringing our blackness with us um, and, and really finding a way to celebrate that. Um, and, and, you know, I, I also agree that absolutely black history is American history. Um, and, and, you know, more of American history is Black history than we probably know. Um, and so, you know, really tap into curiosity. These convers the reason you're here having these conversations is a little curiosity, right? So you're to be applauded for that curiosity and encouraged to keep going with it. Because as I said, the answers to all of these things are at our fingertips. You just got to figure it out. What's the appropriate uh, search term? Um, so yeah, those, those are just some thoughts, some housekeeping, and... And James, how can people find out more about the awesome lineup that's planned for the month of February of events happening in Santa Barbara related to Black history? Yes, um, so I think I should commit to sending out that email. We sent, we had a press release go out on Monday. Uh, there is a plethora of events going on in Santa Barbara uh, throughout Black History Month. Um, the very talented uh, Jordan Killebrew, who by day works for the Santa Barbara Foundation, but by night and any other time is uh, a dedicated community member, took the lead and pulled together this press release that pretty much uh, lays out all the activities and does the context of COVID, right? Understanding that, that our communities are, are disproportionately impacted uh, by this, this disease. And so, uh, um, or this virus, excuse me, there's a difference. Uh, but, um, you know, that, like that is, is something to tap into um, and making sure that you're, you're sharing these different things with uh, the community. There's also the arts and lecture series, uh, a, a series lineup on that. The, the, uh, Kim just dropped that into the chat. So thank you for that. Um, Robin, I will send you that press release. Absolutely. Um, note to self, because I'm getting old. Uh, Great. Um, yeah, and so so plug into that. Tony, Tony, you had something. Go ahead. I, I know we're about to close out. I just want to say that seeing all of you here it is like manna to my soul and gives me hope. And I feel like I've just had just a huge meal of, you know, of serenity looking forward and not and feeling like I'm not in this world, in this community alone. And seeing your face, you know, a black face when on an average day I don't see anyone really means a lot to me. So I appreciate the work that you're doing and everyone that's here. It's hard to articulate just how deeply mean meaningful this is and what it does in, to my spirit. So without me crying, I just want to say that. Well, so, so happy to hear that, Tony. And thank, thank you for sharing that. And, and you know, and, and, and uh, you know, continue to do this stuff. I'm gonna uh, give give one of our sponsors uh, uh, an opportunity to to say our, our farewell here. But you know, at, at, before I do that, I really want to make sure that that I do highlight the, the you know 
the appreciation of the support of the sponsors. I mean, this is laborious work to be able to facilitate and understand and pull in different elements of this history and, and this arc on along this continuum that we're going along. And so organizations that step up, individuals that step up and support this kind of work doesn't have to be me. I don't want to be self-serving. It's about the community. But to support this kind of work is absolutely vital to moving us forward. And we cannot wait for something else or some external factor to figure out what reparations are going to be. We all know that a big element of that is education. And so we, as a local community, can take it upon ourselves to support the organizations that support these conversations and then continue to encourage further conversations to keep the conversation going. Um, and so thank you uh, for the sponsors for that. And without further ado, I'd like to bring in uh, Mr. Quick, who is the CEO of the Center for Education and Academic Development that produces the Elite Scholars Program. All right, Mr. Joyce, thank you so much for the opportunity. I want to say good evening, everyone. I know we're coming to a, a close here, but I want to say that I've really enjoyed the conversation tonight and all the engaging uh, thoughts behind uh, the content of what we've been discussing. Um, uh, racial equity is a conversation I think now it's on the forefront of a lot of conversations around the world. And it's good to know that we have a space that we can come and just kind of share ideas, uh, whether we agree or disagree, the, the fact that we're able to educate and learn from the experience and the conversation, internalize what's being said, and then move forward with exhibiting, you know, our thought in a way that's positive and progressive for all cultures, I think is great. Casey, thank you for your work behind the scene as well. Uh, my name is Deshaun Quick Evans, commonly known or referred to as Mr. Quick. I am the uh, president and CEO of the Center for Education and Academic Development. We are a 501c3 that's been established for about seven years now to provide educational research, uh, resources, programming, and services to low-income, underserved, and disadvantaged youth in the inner cities of Los Angeles, San Bernardino, Santa Barbara counties, uh, including Ventura. And, uh, and we do that for academic success and professional development. And this conversation here has been something that we've been sharing with our elementary school and middle school students because of the recent incidents of what they've been seeing virtually on TV and then in social media, there's been a lot of conversation sparked up about what's going on. And, uh, you know, um, to Judge George point earlier, um, uh, yes, we, we, we need to have more of the conversation and uh, we need to be real about the history of, of, of where we are as a people and where we've come from it's a very sensitive and hard conversation because it can generate a lot of tension. I think uh, that's kind of probably, if, if I'm correct, James, maybe your apprehensiveness in, 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 in presenting uh, the subject matter, which prompts uh, 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 Judge George's response. But I'll tell you, uh, tell you everyone as, as a black person that, yes, I do understand that when we get into these spaces, it's a very difficult conversation without offending anyone. You're not trying to be offensive. You're trying to learn and open up yourself and your spirituality to receiving information. But the news and content of what we talk about sometimes is so tragic that uh, people get emotional and then people kind of go on guard. So um, I think it's great that we have this space. And I think that opportunities like this is where we start. It starts as a, as a seed and we grow from here and we continue on with this conversation in other communities. And we really talk about everything. And I think when you look at reparations, um, it's more than just like I said earlier, you know, like someone commented, just a one quick shot in the arm. No, we got to really talk about how we change the culture and the mindset of the institution of racism, because that's what it is. It's an institution and we can exhibit characteristics that, 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 that uh, 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 promote it, but we can also change that. And so, you know, in looking at the institution and how reparations fits into the part of that conversation, I think is where the deep meaning of, of how we get to where we're going, you know, in regards to a foundation there. But I wanted to also say, I wanna thank uh, uh, Senator Jackson for her work uh, over the years, uh, kind of in the shadow, I've always supported her efforts. And uh, she's one that was in our community as a great leader that put forth a lot of policy and platforms that address racial equity, you know, and ensuring that uh, there was inclusion and diversity across the board. So um, it's just great to know that we have a community like this that we can do this with. And um, I look forward to, to even working closely and more intimately with many of you. You know, you becoming more familiar with me, me becoming more familiar with you, and we're changing the narrative. And I think that's where we're at in 2021 of changing the narrative. We're able to do it now with the polls. We got to put the policy and the action behind it. 
And that takes an individual effort from each one of us when we wake up every day of making a conscious effort to saying, hey, I'm going to go out today and change the narrative. So I thank you for the conversation and thank you for allowing me this opportunity and for being a part. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Quick. Um, there was a question here about when is the next Coffee with a Black Guy event? So um, I, I think I've shared with most of you all, but since uh, uh, the great senator has retired, I've transitioned to be able to do this full time, thankfully, um, and I'm working with a lot of companies and nonprofits and facilitating. And so uh, my February looks absolutely ridiculous because I'm very busy with that stuff. There will be some community events. Uh, so we will be doing some work in the Ojai community. Uh, we'll be doing some work in the Oxnard community. So if you're affiliated with Oxnard High, Union High School District, uh, stay tuned. We'll have some stuff in February. You heard uh, um, uh, Judith mention Word and Life. Uh, that's coming up later in February. And some of this stuff is on the, uh, um, uh, the press release that is out as well. Uh, but some of the, the, the work that I'll be doing is, is specifically with companies. Um, and so th those are more closed sessions and, and, and just as, as fruitful. Um, but uh, um, stay tuned. That's the even better reason to follow on all the social media outlets because we, we, we do let folks know about the stuff there. Uh, and also you can sign up for the newsletter. I try not to send that out too often, uh, but also utilize that as a way to communicate and keep everybody updated. Um, I'm gonna stick around here for a little bit longer if anybody has some other questions, some things you'd like to chat about. Uh, otherwise, I will say farewell, good night. Judge George, get to the, to the dishes uh, because <laughs> we, we heard that. Um, and uh, thank you all for, for engaging. Uh, please let your friends know and we'll have this video up on our YouTube channel uh, uh, momentarily, probably a day or so. Uh, I'm a little bit behind in, in my workflow, but I'm working on it. Great. Quick dropped his contact information in there if anybody would like to get a hold of him. He also is a DJ. He's been doing great stuff online. So he'll deep. last night, I think he DJed somebody's birthday party on, on Zoom. Um, so that was cool. Darren, thank you for stopping by. Glad to hear you didn't have other things going on in the house this evening. It was nice and relaxed and you got to engage. Uh, Patty, thank you for joining Braga, that is, and uh, Patty Colbert. Um, Sean, I know. Sean, be roasting his own coffee. <laughs> I miss the coffee, man. Yes, that's right. You do have a fire pit. That's outdoors. That's COVID safe. Next time, Jeff, thank you, Jeff and Charlotte. Got me spoiled with their mandarin oranges. <laughs> cool, cool. Casey, thank you. Jeez. My pleasure, it was a good conversation tonight. Yeah, no, no, definitely. Um, so glad that Tony got a chance to join and, and share some of her stuff. Absolutely. Rob. We gotta get one of her installations in Santa Barbara. I know we gotta get that figured That's out. That's on my radar. <laughs> Rob, good to see you, brother. Yeah, and Jean just put a, a question in the chat about are we planning to have these with the new series of Race to Justice? You know, Jean, um, it's awesome that they've extended the Race to Justice, but a lot of them fall in February, which is already a really excitingly packed month for James, number one, and for other race and equity related uh, events. So we're just in the midst of trying to figure out what might be possible, but also realizing that if we come together in March and April and May, that's good too. Yeah, no, you, the arts and lectures, they did a real great job of like pepper in February with some good, like February and March with some, some good stuff. Um, and it, what it, See what to me what I read into is they had planned to be in person, so the bet the latter part of their series had planned to be in person. But now that we're still where we are, some of those contracts probably 
uh, were for only being in person. And so they had to fill in with the, some of the virtual stuff. And I mean, just as good, if not better. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I will say that one of the things that we are working on is uh, a panel of Black authors and James moderating that conversation. And we're just right in the midst of trying to figure out if there's a way to fit that into February or if we move that to March. But um, Jervie Chervalon, who's a professor at UCSB in the creative writing department and also an award-winning novelist um, is sort of leading that panel. Um, and then we'll be joined by two other um, really well-known uh, Black authors, Gary Phillips um, being the second. So there are things in the works, just to promise you that. Yeah, and we, we do have some support for that from a department at UCSB, I can't recall right now, but you know, we're still looking to, to build that out, but it would also help to have a little bit more uh, definition on dates and things. So um, yeah, I guess all that to, to be said is we're working on it. <laughs> and we also see that there's been an interest both tonight as well as two weeks ago to dig deeper into the topic of reparations. And so we're also thinking about a standalone event that right. sort of straddles reparations 101 plus right. a deeper dive into what that looks like locally. Um, to put forward sometime in the spring. Yeah, and, and, and in our conversations, Casey and I, I mean, what keeps coming up is, is this whole notion of truth and reconciliation, what that's looked like in other countries, um, and you know, really trying to think about, okay, where are we headed so we're not reactive in the conversations, that we're a little bit more proactive in our conversations. Um, and so that, that's the hope. Oh, mailing less. Uh, I think, what did they say? I think we're a close uh, between five and 700 or something like that, folks that, that have uh, signed on to learn more. Great. Yeah. Good deal. Yeah, thanks All for right. your support, Gene. Yeah, no, Gene is a, is a rock star. Hey, Gene, I, I'll I, come I, I Gene, have been... oh, Go ahead, I'm Gene. Sorry, go ahead, Gene. I'm sorry. Um, when I was at one of these talks, I had Googled something and this um, article came up. I'm from Highland Park, Illinois, and that's 20 minutes from Evanston, Illinois, where Northwestern University is. And um, they had a program that I think started a couple of years ago, a reparations program. Have you heard of it? I haven't. That... Um, there, the city of Evanston came up with, and it was right when marijuana, or medical or recreational marijuana became legal. And so they were using the marijuana tax that they were um, getting for um, $25,000 payments for people they had to prove, I don't know, a one quarter descendancy of people who lived in Evanston between certain decades. Mm -hmm. And um, it's the first, you know, and people I know that live in that area had not heard of it. So it was, it's interesting that this actually has happened and is already in existence. Well, and that, that idea, I mean, sounds appealing because it's a direct agricultural link, right? Because the whole slavery thing was labor for cotton, which was a commodity that we built our economy and economic base off of. And so to have another commodity, more or less, start to funnel that, I mean, it, it makes financial sense to me. Except I don't think they were, they were growing cotton in Illinois, but it might be right. people right. that worked in factories. Right. They just, you just had to prove, I think, that you lived in a certain area around there between certain years. And um, I will, you can Google it. I found it by accident yeah. and I was so shocked because I, I grew up there, you know, I was, I was shocked. Evanston is considered a liberal area, but not anywhere near as like Berkeley or, right. you know. Right. Well, I, I think what, what I've learned through these conversations is liberal does not always equal good, right? <laughs> That's not, that's not, I mean, 
like liberal comfortability has been what has allowed this racist racism to propagate. Um, and and we're getting past that now. Quick, you had you had something? Now, I, I was just going to say that, uh, you know, I, I thought the judge hit on something that that's another great segue for another topic conversation. And that is, you know, how do we manage our, our uh, you know, have these conversations in a way that's constructive and not too sensitive or too emotional where they could be offensive. I think like your platform, you know, Coffee with a Black Guy is a, is, it's a great way to do it. You know, that it, it, that's, it, it gives a good safe space. You bring good content and, 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 and good information and connects the dots. But, you know, how often do we get these spaces like this where we can converse with multiple members of our community of different and diverse backgrounds without people going on the defensive real quick, especially from the black community, you know, uh, because of the mindset. And so I think like reparations is good. It, it's, it's a good conversation, it's a good thought, but that ain't the answer. The answer is our attitude and character of how we engage and respond to each other. I can give you a million dollars, but I still don't have to like you at the end of the day. You see what I mean? So I think that it, it, it segues to a good conversation as far how do we learn to live in this space, in this society where we're about inclusion, equity, and diversity, where we're about that every day in our mind and thinking that will attack and break down those uh, barriers of the institution, I think. Uh, but the conversation has to be had. We have to hear from one another that I'm comfortable with you right. and you're comfortable right. with me in knowing that that was the past, this is the future, and this is what we're doing to, to move in a more progressive manner. So I thought it was great that, that, that he made that comment. Uh, the author was, I thought her definition when she was asked about rep reparations was really great because she listed like half a dozen or more things and then kind of got to reparations, you know, so many things have to happen. And that's what you're saying too. Yep. So, yeah, Re Re right reparations, right on point. reparations without the realization, reparations without the relationships, like neither of those work. Right, right. I think that's what you're saying, Mr. Right. Quick. Yep, no, that's yeah. exactly what I'm saying. That's what I say, the Gene's comments too, is right on point, you're right, you know, that, that's what I'm saying, that it, it's more than just, the thought of the concept, <laughs> you know, there's right. a lot more that needs to get put in place. Right. Yeah. So, uh, James, maybe truth and reconciliation becomes recognition and reparations, <laughs> something right. like that. Right. You know. Because James and I were just, you know, chatting back and forth, and you know, obviously, truth and reconciliation comes from South Africa, which is an amazing model. But Americans like American things. And so we need to figure out what this looks like in our own context, um, because I think that will go a bit of the way towards people embracing the concept rather than feeling like it's an import being right. you know, put upon us. Feeling buy-in. Right. Yeah, exactly. I think I had asked a, a different meeting whether or not there's been any study on the effects of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, over time. I, I'm not aware of any, but it'd be interesting, you know, what are some things to learn that worked and maybe things to learn that didn't work as well as they had hoped. I'm sure there's got to, I mean, to hear that, there's got to yeah, be definitely. There's got to be something. Yeah. Also, Wilkerson spoke about the process that Germany's undertaken. She spoke yeah. about this on Tuesday. And um, so that is something else, you know, again, to look to, not to take, you know, cut paste way, but, um, you know, how to acknowledge the history um, and, and really integrate all of the knowledge uh, into the fabric of the, of the country, um, as well as making amends and restitution. Right. I had a brilliant thought. Reparations, 
with resentment don't work. That's the resentment. We got to get over that whole resentment. You give the check and there's resentment. That does not work, right? So we got to figure out like the educational aspect is to, to debunk the resentment that would happen. Mm -hmm. And you're saying the resentment is only on, on one side or both sides? I didn't say it was on either any side, I, but you know. Well, what did you mean when you say reparations? Without so, so if so, imagine if reparations are paid and next year, say reparations are paid next year, seventy-four million Americans are going to be pissed as hell because and they're going to feel like something was taken away from them. They're going to resent the fact that reparations were paid. They're going to resent the fact that Black folks have money now, and we've got to go through education to get over that resentment because as Isabel Wilkerson pointed out, like if, 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 if you, if we know our real history, you don't have to make a case for reparations because like that's an American, that's a very American and global ideal. I mean, we've got uh, restitution in courts. Uh, you know, we've got uh, reparations have been paid to, to the, uh, the Japanese who were interred in internment camps. Uh, you've got, you know, the situation with Native Americans and how the, the, the tribal, but then there's also some direct payments that have been made. Uh, we can look at Germany, we can look at uh, South Africa, there's many examples that, that we can, can look to. Um, and I, I, I think most of the success came from that education, you know, not just yeah. you know, the thing, because I mean, what, 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 what Isabel Wilkinson was pointing out about um, about Germany, and I think Tony Scott even has has some work in this area of where what Germany has done to not forget the Holocaust, right? Like they keep monuments of that to remind folks. Like kids take field trips to remind them, and 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 so that's part of like we don't erase the history, we 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 reckon with it, and we get real about it. Yeah. The whole education piece and starting with young kids, you know, the whole thing of kids either get taught hate or get taught love or acceptance or and compassion. So yeah. I think there's some, you know, you got to be, yeah, it, it's so much of it's taught. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it interesting how Valentine's Day is in Black History Month, and the whole notion behind Black History Month is, or, or Valentine's Day is love, and essentially that's exactly what we need to do to move us forward: is is, is embrace that principle. What are they? What are they? Uh, I think what in my neighborhood we used to call that a quinky dink. Quinky <laughs> dink. <laughs> and it's something I had never even occurred to me. Right. So you know, because it's not out there in the culture at large doesn't even make that connection. Nope. Yeah. As a parting thought for me, uh, I think you're spot on with the education part. I think it goes, it's important that we think about it beyond just an education piece. It has to be an understanding though, and where all this actually came from. So you can educate till, you know, whenever, and people still don't take it in, they don't understand it. And I think that's where the reconciliation comes in and you don't have 74 million white people pissed off whenever this does happen because they understand where it all came from. Man, so you know, thank you for sharing that because what just like the image that just popped into my head is you know how, how a lot of recent high school graduates, they have a gap year. Imagine if America committed to a 10 to 15 year gap year experience where after you graduate, you're paid you, like, you're not paid, but you, you uh, instead of going directly into college, you have to go through this thing, through this truth and reconciliation experience or whatever. I think, I mean, you, we look at, um, <laughs> here's my pop culture reference to, to how I understand things. So I saw an interview with Wonder Woman, Gal Gadot, and she was talking about how she had, when growing up in Israel, she had to do her, her service, her military service. Like they're required to do their military service. I'm like, damn, even she had to do that? Like, and so imagine if we put a system like that and say like, okay, in order, like you can't get into any college graduate or otherwise until you've gone through this experience for the next 25 years. Like making a commitment like that, that's bold. 
That's systemic. Yeah, I, I think it goes back to that idea of the othering that somebody mentioned earlier, is that when you can go, like I think of a national work program or something along those lines where you have to go kind of like an Israeli military to just serve in some place that is foreign to you so that you get that experience of being around the other and seeing that they're really not all that different from you. Right. Right. I mean, and even what you're doing with, with the, the, the kite work, right? Like people being attracted to doing a different experience and making a bond and a connection. That's what somebody would mentioned earlier on the Zoom is that, you know, it doesn't always have to be talking about the elephant in the room. It can sometimes just be about an experience. And, you know, what you, you know, the, the, I don't want to minimize what you do, but it's like using um, kites to like ride the wind. Like it's a, what I've heard you explain to me is it, it's, 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 it's a fun thing, but it's also a bit of a grounding and a spiritual thing. And so to be able to have various experiences like that, it may be that it may be, you know, going to a sweat lodge. It may be a variety of things that bring people into this. But I, I think those kinds of experiences are, are important. High five. <laughs> right. <laughs> What's the kites? What do you do with kites? Um, I fly power kites down here at East Beach. It's kind of a, an all-in-one physical, meditative, spiritual experience that I have been uh, blessed enough to share with a number of individuals, and it's been life-changing for me and, and others as well. And so, I, you know, I haven't thought about it in this context, but thank you for mentioning it that way. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Very cool. All right, folks, I got to get some Super. food. Me too. Great to be together tonight. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Yeah. Take care.